Good morning. You know, sometimes people are apprehensive about praying out loud, especially if someone else is around. I think sometimes we surrender to a cultural assumption that our voice doesn't count. It doesn't matter. I think one of the reasons that scripture calls us to a vocalized prayer is because our voice actually does matter. It does make a difference. And when we declare things, when we ask things, it does change how things will go from that point forward. So I really want to applaud you and tell you how great I think it is that we're willing to take our lips, our voice, and ask for something from God or declare something about God. We're continuing our series in Matthew, and we're in Matthew chapter uh, 1, beginning in verse 18. And I know you're going to think that I've, I've, I've lost track of what time of year it is, because this is typically talked about during Christmas time. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. I, I wish I could tell you that every woman that discovers she's pregnant is happy about it, or that every husband is thrilled with that news. A lot of emotions can um, come to people who are facing both that opportunity and responsibility. And when we look at the story, I have to acknowledge that this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people when it comes to faith. You don't get babies without sex. And anybody who thinks differently must be at least naive, if not outright ignorant. But the truth is, is that anytime we read or hear of God doing something that is not just hard, but impossible, we actually struggle with that, don't we? We are more comfortable with a God who can just do a better job than we can do. But we can be pretty uncomfortable with a God who can do things we can't do at all. And this story kind of confronts that tendency uh, within us. Uh, two of the four Gospels actually refer to the virgin birth. <clears throat> Matthew takes this position from from uh, the experience of, of Joseph. Uh, Luke actually takes from the perspective of Mary. The other two Gospels don't uh, directly reference the virgin birth, and some people have wondered if that means that maybe it didn't really happen. But not only is it referenced in two Gospels uh, directly by telling the story, as we're going to see a little bit later, uh, the Gospel of John also makes reference to it, and Paul talks about it. I think that it's, it's fair to say that there's sufficient evidence in Scripture to support this as a, an appropriate doctrine. But, uh, pun intended, it's inconceivable to us that you could get a baby without sex. <clears throat> What's going on here? Well, <clears throat> Matthew's actually showing us Kind of a picture of new creation, just like the Holy Spirit hovered over the formless world before God spoke. The Holy Spirit will now hover over the womb of a woman. God is starting over. In fact, in the faith of Abraham, there was a miraculous birth. 
Uh, Sarah is 90 years old. Uh, how many in the room are relatively happy about the fact that when you are 90 and if you are female, pregnancy is not likely to be an option for you? <laughs> that would be a you've got to be kidding moment, right? And what was God doing? <clears throat> he was starting a new family that was going to be a blessing to the entire world. And what is God doing now? Through the virgin birth, he's starting a new family. And it's going to make a difference in the world. So there's very powerful pictures here. So we're going to look at what the virgin birth teaches us about three different areas. And the first area is what does the virgin birth teach us about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And we're given a clue here. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He's also given the name Emmanuel, a savior, a Messiah with two names for this miracle born baby. Jesus means salvation of the Lord. The Old Testament name for God was Yahweh. So it's Yahweh Shua, Yahweh the Lord saves. Um, the Old Testament pronunciation of that would be Joshua. And so Jesus is being given that name. So he will save who? His people. From what? Their sins. That's not what anybody wanted to hear. What they wanted was a Messiah who was going to save them politically because they were being occupied by Rome. They wanted to be saved economically because life was difficult and hard to manage under the current economic circumstances. They wanted to be saved from the sins of other people because it's the sins of their oppressors that had made their life so miserable and, and difficult. And so any time God comes to us and he says, I've come to save you from your sins, we get uncomfortable with that. We want God to fix the stuff around us. We don't necessarily want God to fix the stuff in us. But that's exactly what Jesus came to do. And so he has come not only to save us from our sins, but he actually calls us to love people who are sinning against us. Love your enemies. Um, our culture right now is teaching us how to hate other people. It really doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on politically. You will find voices and you will find opportunities to demonize and to hate other people. And Jesus says, the sins you need to be focused on are not the ones that are committed against you, but the ones committed by you and the ones committed against you, you need to express love to them. And I can tell you that's an offensive message in this culture as it has been in every culture. So. Matthew has not yet revealed how Jesus is going to save people from their sins, but in chapter 26 at the Last Supper, Jesus actually declares how he will do that. And here's the point. It's not just Jesus also saves people from their sins. Only Jesus saves people from their sins. That this name actually strikes down any idol we tend to erect that would indicate that something we do, something we build, or something we follow will actually be the salvation of our lives. That only Jesus can do that. And the second name is Emmanuel. It means God with us. See, God had actually been planning for a very long time the salvation of his people. And in fact, uh, Matthew quotes, he doesn't say it's from Isaiah, but that's where the passage is found. It's Isaiah chapter 7, and it's the first of what's called fulf uh, 10 fulfillment passages in Matthew. Ten times in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew will say, this was done so that this scripture would be fulfilled. It's a fascinating thing to see how he is confirming and affirming who Jesus is through what scripture has said. The Old Testament kind of lays out God's plan. A lot of times when we look at scripture, we treat it more like a riddle to be solved than a gospel to be believed. Scripture is good news. And Isaiah 7 made a promise. And Isaiah and the people who heard it believed it was something that was going to be fulfilled in their day. And there actually was something that occurred in their day that would qualify as a fulfillment. But 
He's also talking about something that's going to happen, and this is uh, something that God does through prophetic words. It can address something in the immediate generation, but also foretell something that is to come. God has a way of doing that with the words that he speaks. The focus is always on Jesus. And the point is not well how, how well Isaiah predicted what would happen with Jesus. It's how well Jesus fulfilled what Isaiah predicted. That's actually quite a change in perspective. Prophecy points to Jesus. Now, most of Israel actually did not anticipate a virgin birth for their Messiah. Matthew knew the story of Jesus' conception. And when he saw that verse of scripture, he said, even this was foretold. God is with us. He's not separated from us. He's not disconnected from our difficult or dangerous circumstances. He's not intimidated by the things that discourage us, the things that cause pain in our lives, the things that, that break us. He's, he is with us. And what's really interesting is the last quoted words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28 are these. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How many are glad God is? Is always with you always with you that's a good place to applaud it really is so what does a virgin birth teach us about how people follow Jesus so we know the virgin birth teaches us that Jesus will save people from their sins and that God is with us what does it teach about followers of Jesus now Mary's pregnancy was actually humiliating to Joseph uh, scripture had precedent for miraculous births but Nothing like this. And so Joseph, we are told, followed the law. Some translations say he was a just man. Some translations say he was a righteous man. And what he had done is he had made some decisions about how he was going to live his life based on his desire to honor and please God. He took his faith seriously. And he decided he would not just be a law unto himself. I will live life on my terms. That's a common approach to life. But what does he do? He honors God with his choices. Joseph knew he was not the father of Mary's baby because he had determined that he would wait for physical intimacy until their marriage. Following God includes choosing God's direction over our personal desire. This is an interesting thing to me. Our culture believes that if you can control your actions, you actually love less. That the only reason that you would wait until marriage is you just don't love that person enough. If you're completely out of control, that's what real love is. May I suggest to you that's a dangerous definition of love. And by the way, nearly every painful memory and experience we have is because somebody was a law unto themselves and they did what they desired when it came to us. So Joseph learns that Mary's pregnant. This is interesting. He decides that he does want to divorce her. That's actually a legal term because in the ancient world, an engagement was as legally binding as the marriage itself. So you didn't just give a ring back or ask for a ring back. You had to go through a process. But he wants to do this privately because he doesn't want to shame Mary. Real righteousness, look, real righteousness doesn't just choose God's ways over our personal desires. Real righteousness does not look to shame or demean others who don't live that way. People who are look down, looking down their noses, people who are pointing their fingers, and they feel superior because they think that they have made the right choices. If we're looking down on others, that's not real righteousness. That's self-righteousness. That's not the same thing at all. When people use shame in other people's lives, the primary reasons are to divert attention away from ourselves and to exercise control over someone else. It's not healthy. And it's not righteousness. And it doesn't honor God. Now, our conscience can tell us when we've crossed a line and done something that's bad. But shame comes along and doesn't just say you did a bad thing. It says you are a bad person. And once you accept that as true, it's really hard to ever find your way out of the hole that that creates. 
So, in the ancient world, this would require legal action to break the engagement. What's fascinating here is that real righteousness is sensitive to God, but it's also sensitive to the needs of others. And so an angel comes to Joseph in a dream. We're getting a crash course in how God uh, interacts and, and communicates with people. In chapter one, we saw that he, he taught us through history, through the genealogy. He also teaches us through his word. We have reference to Isaiah seven, and now he's speaking through a dream. And he shows up in a dream with an angel, and he tells Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The baby that she's carrying is actually a work of the Holy Spirit, not an indiscretion of your fiancé. And when Joseph wakes up, he simply does what he was told without argument or without demanding attention. Do what God asks without calling attention to yourself. That's what real righteousness does. That's the result of a virgin birth. Righteousness is just simple obedience, less showing off, and more just going about the direction that's been given. What's fascinating to me is we don't have a single quote from Joseph in all of this. He just gets up and he does what he has been asked to do. It also tells us that Joseph did not consummate the marriage until after the birth of Jesus. There are some people in the Christian faith who believe that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life. There's some problems associated with that in scripture itself. In Matthew chapter 12 and again in chapter 13, we are both introduced to people as brothers and sisters, children of Mary, and they're brothers and sisters of Jesus. If we insist that Mary had to remain a virgin in order to prove that she was pleasing God, we might be unintentionally demeaning human sexuality and the institution of marriage, something that God does not intend for us to do. Mary is not less because she kept the vows of marriage that she had made to her husband. When God was looking for a woman to use, he didn't single out a woman who'd already taken a vow of celibacy and was in no way interested in a marriage relationship. She, in fact, was already engaged to Joseph. God's selection was not based on that. It was on what was going on in her heart. So that's something that we learn about what it means to follow Jesus as a result of the virgin birth. And then lastly, what does the virgin birth teach us about our spiritual life? Uh, it is the Holy Spirit that brings the life of Jesus inside of Mary. I, I understand that's a stumbling block. I understand that's difficult to accept. I do. Quite honestly, it would be easier for me as a communicator of spiritual truth if that passage wasn't in Scripture. I understand our difficulty in accepting such things. But here's what I want you to think about. Christ coming into our world has always been the work of the Holy Spirit, not the work of of human effort. Every conversion is a work of the Holy Spirit. In a way, every conversion is a virgin conception. It is not our effort. It is not our accomplishments. It is not our achievement. It is not something we did in order to create spiritual life inside of us. Outside of the work of the Holy Spirit, there is no life within us. And when the Holy Spirit brings Jesus into our world, what does he do? He takes God and, and we see him as flesh. That's the, uh, the, the theological term is God incarnate. Right? So what does that mean? God in the flesh. Not God incognito. He's not disguising himself. He's using flesh to reveal himself. So where the Holy Spirit is at work, Jesus is always made human. 
And here's a challenge, is sometimes people want to, out of, a, out of a desire to, in their mind, elevate Jesus, they make him so spiritual that he becomes unapproachable and he becomes disconnected from others. The Holy Spirit came upon the womb of Mary and the result is, is that we get a Savior who walks with us and who sits at the table with us and can listen to us and can, and can converse with us. This is the kind of Jesus the Holy Spirit brings into our world. How many are glad? We serve a God who's not distant, but a God who's present. Yes? So I'll ask the worship team to come out, but this is what it says in John, the first chapter. And this is John's reference uh, to this truth. He says, the true light that gives, uh, let me go back. The true life that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. It's talking about Jesus. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen to this next verse. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. That's what happens to us. When we look to Christ and we are willing to receive him into our life, and trust that the things he says are true. Life is formed inside of us. Spiritual life is ignited. Christianity is not about your capacity to achieve. It's about your willingness to receive what God has done for you. To those who receive Jesus, who dare to believe and to trust that what he said is true, supernatural birth occurs inside of them. It's not the result of you being born into a certain genetic family. It's not the result of a decision made by someone else for you in your life. It's yielding, it's yielding to a decision made by God. So my question for you, will you receive the God who saves you from your sins? My question for you, will you receive the God who is with you no matter what? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Uh, Father, the, the truth is, is that sometimes we imagine we can generate spiritual life within ourselves. Read the right things, say the right things, do the right things and life happens. But the simple truth is, is that as hard as we try and as much as we say, all the things we do, we cannot generate life within us that is from you. So I'm asking for every person in this room today and who's watching online, for all who receive you, for all who trust you, will you do in us what we cannot do in ourselves and give us that new spiritual life? Christ in us, the hope of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand this morning.